Welcome into Dynasty Week, everybody. On today's episode, we're going to talk about some older players, some veterans that we think still have some value, some difficult decisions that people are making in their rookie drafts, and a Dynasty mailbag. Make sure you like this episode, subscribe, leave us some comments, and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your host, Andy Holloway. Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Tuesday, May 9th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Andy, Mike, and Jason. Back with you. Excited to be with you. Lots going on. Got a great show for you today. How you doing, Mr. Moore? I'm doing great. My uh, my brain is inside of Google Sheets right now. <laughs> so, like, if you ask me a question, you might get some formula back. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, beep, I think bop, boop, beep, beep, bop, boop. <laughs> That's what a formula <laughs> sounds that like. Is that is a direct recording. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, Jason is speaking of um, we're in the in the mire, so to speak. We're we're in the midst of our ultimate draft kit player by player projections and rankings. Had a little rankings retreat myself this past weekend. Sat on a porch up I was, north. I was really jealous. See, we I I go into like a a cave, a stack cave, and you're out in the woods. Having a nice time with great weather, statting all day. Why didn't I do that? I've I've been wanting to do that for years. We finally did it, and it was it was wonderful. Well, it wasn't we. Yeah, it was you. Yeah, pretty selfish. Me and my <laughs> spreadsheets. Uh, Mike, uh, how are you doing today? I am fantastic. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I I did make it into the office yesterday. We're recording this early on Tuesday, and then straight to you. But um. I thought I'd see you both yesterday, but you were on what uh, Al Borland had dubbed Staten Island. Yes. Ooh, very nice. Yes. I was actually in New York. Your rankings come yeah. easier yeah. when you are. I got a stat on Staten, baby. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of work to get out there. But it makes them accurate. So our ultimate draft kit, it drops. Uh, Brooks, you got the countdown? Do you know the amount of days? I mean, I feel like you should. Please hold. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like 23 days or something like that? Pretty close to that, yeah. <laughs> Pretty under, close. Under 24. 31. Under 24. Yeah. Subtract yeah. 9. June 1st, it comes out. And uh, you can check that out at ultimatedraftkit.com. Got a couple exciting things going on today. Uh, <laughs> I've been holding this drink as though I'm going to drink it for way too long. Like I got pre-sip on my mug. And then I've just, you're I realize I got a lot to say. Now you're and committed I, to and holding I have not, it. I'm not lowering this till no, I take a sip. You have to. Oh, how was that sip? It was, um, it was worth the wait. What do we got going on? We got a giveaway. Very exciting. Picked up some sweet items to hand out to the Foot Clan. A Justin Jefferson signed jersey is up for grabs right now. Well, wow. how do, how would I win that? Um, <laughs> okay, Clevis. Uh, <laughs> Foot Clan giveaway. I love Justin. Foot Clan giveaway dot com. That was a different voice of public opinion. By I'm the way. not the public opinion. I just like Justin Jefferson. Honestly, I'm I'm really surprised we're giving away a Justin Jefferson signed jersey. A you little, didn't even know this, did you? I, well, I saw it this morning, uh, but I didn't know it yesterday. <laughs> I, I, I a little inside information. We usually keep the best ones for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke. Like we, you know, it's like oh. We put them this up on the wall. This one is great. We want to keep this for the wall. We're giving away a Justin Jefferson signed jersey. Heck yeah. Yeah. It's uh, footclangiveaway.com. Completely free to enter. Just go to the website, footclangiveaway.com. Support the show. We'll give you a free Justin Jefferson signed jersey. We'll give that away here in a little bit. And of course, we've talked a lot about the new Dynasty podcast. It's once a week. Mm -hmm. It's got uh, Matthew Betts, Kyle Borgannoni. And then generally Mike, Jason, some combination. It's been uh, it's been great so far. It's a smashing success. But we do not ignore Dynasty here on the Fantasy Footballers either. Welcome. 
Welcome to Dynasty Week. Yeah, baby. That's a good drop. It's that time of year. So uh, today's show, Thursday's show, we'll have a special Dynasty focus. We're going to be talking about um, some pretty good stuff on on the next couple of episodes. I know that uh, a lot of fantasy players out there, rookie draft time, dynasty startup drafts, a lot of questions. Uh, we just added the two quarterback rankings to the ultimate draft kit for the first time ever as well. Um, I know that I, that's some feedback I've gotten from a lot of dynasty players is that they want three quarterback now. No, no, not three. <laughs> it's never enough for you people. <laughs> How many quarterbacks do you need? Um, no, it's just that there's a lot of, a lot of new dynasty leagues are in the two quarterback super flex category. Sure. So, uh, we don't want to ignore that. And, and so we got the rankings up there. Um, but no, this week's going to be dynasty focused. Our, our quick question of the day. And uh, our segment on today's show and the mailbag, all with a dynasty spin. And I'm I'm looking forward to discussing some of these players. You know, it's a lot more subjective in the dynasty realm. There's a lot more, uh, you know, you're not just looking at one year prognostication, which is easier to do. You know, you can kind of understand what the coaching situation is like for a team, what their schedule looks like. You know, what the depth chart looks like for one year. That's very easy. But when you look over the long period of time, you know, you get coaching changes that maybe you don't expect. And that longevity projection is is more difficult. Sure. And, and this year, especially in, in the rookie drafts, you know, usually there's like a pretty standard consensus, at least ADP of through the first round or so. You, you know which guys are going to go around where. But this year... I feel like once you get through in a single quarterback through pick 106, maybe 107, if you uh, believe that Richardson is the 107, which he is very frequently. After that, it is it's the wild, wild west of I've seen players drafted at the 108, 109, who in a different league don't go to like the middle of the second round, and it's just the the values. It's pure chaos right now in the rookie streets. Do you feel like so? You feel like we've actually settled in on our wrong consensus for this year? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah for the first six for the picks. first six yeah. seven picks. That that brings us to our quick question: the rookie drafts. What is a tough uh, a tough dynasty rookie draft decision you've had to make in your leagues? Uh, I mean, mine is is clear because I have gone back and forth on the rankings in the ultimate draft kit. It, I've gone back and forth in my mind. I've gone back and forth in my heart. And when I'm on the clock, I don't want to be in this position where I have to choose between Devon A. Chain and Zach Charbonnet. I can't figure out who is better because my pre-draft process, I loved Charbonnet. And even though I liked A. Chain, I was pretty much out on him because he's sub 190 pounds. We know historically that doesn't work. Um, then Charbonnet gets second round draft capital. And I love him, and he goes to a run first team. That all seems great, but he's obviously the backup. Kenneth Walker is there, and he's the veteran, and he's young. <laughs> so from a dynasty perspective, it's like, does that just right. ruin Charbonnet? I don't think it does. Um, and then the landing spot for A-Chain, still a day two pick. It was around three. And he goes to the Dolphins for the most perfect scheme fit imaginable. I have... Not completed every team. I'm about two thirds the way through the teams, but I have done for this year's uh, stat purposes. I have done both of these teams, Seattle and Miami, and this season I have a chain uh, higher and having a pretty good season. So right this second, I think I lean a chain. Don't it's, it's ask funny me five you, minutes from now. Yeah, <laughs> you, you said you uh, you've been confused in your heart, your head. Maybe this is a pick you make with your bowels. It, mm, oh. nice. At least I'll make it while on the toilet. Well, that the odds are high of that. Um, I was going to bring up what you kind of alluded to at the end, which was that this decision will not get figured out in one year either. Like you may have a leader in the clubhouse because I would, I'd be with you that I think a chain has a more total fantasy points year one. And yet you could still be wrong on that pick. Mm -hmm. That'll be the interesting thing. Uh, my answer here is, None. <laughs> there have been no difficult picks for me. 
Andy doesn't I got, even know who the rookies are. I got no picks, suckers. <laughs> and, right, Brooks? Oh, yeah. No pick crew. Andy and Brooks run their dynasty team very much like the Los Angeles Rams of late. They're just like, no, I I only want veterans. No Look, rookies allowed. I could have thrown an answer in here, but I felt like it might be more viable to talk about the approach I've had for the past couple of years, which is, look, this is I'm a guy who also has – I got Greg Dulcich last year. I didn't have a pick in the rookie draft. And so there's a time right now to go out and grab some of these. If you're in only a, a, a two- or three-round rookie draft, go go grab a few of these players. Charlie yes. Jones, slot receiver in Cincinnati. There are, uh, you know, Evan Holt. Take a couple Michael shots. Michael Wilson, third-round draft pick for, for the, the Cardinals. Arizona Cardinals. Is it a good pick? Probably not, but <laughs> – you have to take the chance that maybe they know what they're doing. I mean, Tyreek Hill was a player that was picked up mm -hmm. yes. off of waivers when he first came out into the league. So um, have I had to have a difficult draft decision? No, but I have made decisions on, you know, dropping some low ceiling uh, bottom dwellers on my 18 man bench in our dynasty league and saying, I'm just going to throw some of these names in there. And honestly, I think tight end is one of those places that it's worth doing that with as well. Just be, look at all the tight ends that were drafted this year that were names that maybe, you know, Daryl Washington got a lot of notoriety, but it wasn't Musgrave. It wasn't uh, Shoemaker. And so, Shoeman! <laughs> if you put one some of those names on the bench, you, you could be surprised. Yeah. Um, for the, the When the rookie draft comes around for our main dynasty league, for Andy what that means is that he now has three more draft picks to trade three years from now he's got now he's got right now right now now he could trade 2026 Honestly, i've already made one offer with my 2026 <laughs> exactly they'll be First gone round draft they'll pick. be gone in a month get him while he's got him mike who's the more difficult decision for you right now in dynasty leagues so i think in a rookie drafts that dalton kincaid buffalo tight end is extremely difficult to rank because we historically speaking to, drafting these tight ends is a waste of your pick. Uh, they don't hit. I mean, you just – Jason has laid this out recently of uh, – like, I don't – how far back did you go, Jay? Like 10 I went a years? decade. And the answer is how many are you actually happy you drafted? And it's like, well, Mark Andrews and – Evan Ingram. It was it – was but, but even Evan Ingram was like it would, like he had a great rookie year and then it was just pain. Next year, pain. Next year, it was just over and over of like, I know he could do it, it but and if the Evan Ingram truth is out there, if you held on, we're sort of rewarded now with, with his uh, career looking like it's coming back in Jacksonville, but it was, you thought you had a tight end of the future, and you kept playing him over and over for years, and you were getting no little to no production from Evan Ingram, so it's been very difficult, but Dalton Kincaid, the Buffalo Bills trade up over a, a team that looked like they were slotted for a tight end. We're talking about the Dallas Cowboys because they really needed one. They jumped them in the draft. They go get Dalton Kincaid, the first uh, tight end off the draft board, and he is an offensive weapon. This is a move tight end. This isn't a pick for we're bolstering our offensive line. We're this getting, is your slot wide receiver. You're getting a playmaker who, uh, I mean, two years ago in Utah, 36 for 5, 10, and 8. Okay, that, that's – that's actually not that bad for a tight end. Follows that up 70 for 890 yards and eight touchdowns. I mean, just and just ludicrous usage, too. That, that was a dominator rating of 29% this past year. That's fantastic for a tight end. And the Buffalo Bills didn't do really anything else for their pass catchers. No, they lost I'm, Isaiah McKenzie. They, yeah, they got rid of McKenzie. Like, Khalil Shakir should be the slot wide receiver. But I think there is a strong chance that sooner than later – Dalton Kincaid is actually the the number two option on this team. Odds are totally, totally against it. But if that hit, if that actually came through, I mean that would be that would be probably the best pick us uh, aside from Bijan Robinson. If Dalton Kincaid turns into the player that the Buffalo Bills think he can be, yeah, it, it is a really, really difficult selection right now. If you're on Twitter. If you follow draft people or fantasy people on Twitter, it is universally pro Dalton Kincaid. Everyone loves him. Everyone is like he's the slot guy. He's, he's already be. a top twelve tight end in best ball. It's it's really wild, and I feel because of that, not from a contrarian standpoint, but just like a draft cost. 
it just just a trying to help people not go crazy. What are you doing? It's like <laughs> I I am so anti Dalton Kincaid. Not because I don't like him. He's very talented. Not because it's not a good situation. It could be great. But just because it's not going to work. Well, like, it's not going to work but, out because he's a tight end and no tight ends are good. But Jason. But he's. But, but, but let me, it let might me work you, this time. Where does Jordan Addison go if he was the pick to Buffalo? Oh, super high. Two? Oh, as far as like rookie, draft. rookie drafts. I mean, maybe Jameer. You, you would have the Jameer Gibbs argument. But you would. If Addison had fallen to Buffalo. Then yeah, people would make the the Jackson Smith and Jigba or Jordan yeah. Addison. And, I, and I'm not arguing anything against you. I think you're right. But but what makes it so difficult is that if you know, because everything coming out of Buffalo too, the discussions of the the beat reporters there, it's like there's a really good chance Dalton Kincaid is a slot wide receiver that they drafted. Yes, I mean they they paid uh, Dawson Knox a bunch of money. He's going to be there for a long time. He's a blocker, and he's a blo he he's a good blocker, and so. It's like if that's what your brain does. But he's not he's if, not good enough to be a slot wide receiver rookie year. I mean, long term, you know, this 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 I could mean, still be a good I'm just saying the, the Jordan question. Addison versus Dalton Kincaid. Jordan Addison is a bomb wide receiver. He is set up ready as a route runner. I think Dalton Kincaid is as good as he could have been at that. I so think he's as good him, as he could be as a tight end, yeah. As a big slot receiver. Yeah, no, I mean, we'll, we will see. I mean, wild. I think, and it's like the, they've yeah they've they've tried to say some nice things about Gabe Davis. Gabe Davis, th that ain't it, man. He is he's not the number. He cannot be the number two for this offense, and them, you know, complete their plans of winning a Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think it's a bit of a trap, but the trap is so tempting to fall into because yes. it's it's a golden bear trap. I'm, no, there's like can, there's ice cream inside of it. <laughs> yes. There's candy. Like I want to go in. I don't care if I'm trapped in there. It's, There's candy inside. I I would say it's it's more along the lines of like it's a winning lottery ticket. It's a million dollars in yes. there. It's a it's scratchers like, at the bottom yeah. of the. You you <laughs> might you will probably lose your leg, but if you don't, it's a million dollars. <laughs> well, that's why he's going so high in best ball. Yeah, if it hits, if he's a Jimmy Graham, then right. like Mike said, the, he's probably the best pick in the uh, at the back of the first round. He won't be. Probably. Probably. <laughs> Probably. That, and that's why it There's is. a 10% chance that it's right. Like, it, mathematically, historically, that's kind of the hit rate. 10% chance that he will be a valuable Can pick. we get him a couple more points because he's in Buffalo with Josh Allen? Can we bump 12, that to 12? Have you, have okay, you, yeah, let's go 12%. Have you, have you run the numbers on tight ends that go to a top five quarterback that caught more than 800 yards? in their season, and then we're drafted in the first round. Have you run the hit rate on those? Pretty small sample size. <laughs> Pretty small. That's the that's the hardest part about those. And, uh, look, if, from a bigger picture, it's a bad bet. It's tough. That's a really tough one. So what, what makes that's why it, I don't have rookie picks. I've yeah. got to make that decision. <laughs> what makes it Give easier, me the <laughs> because prior to the NFL draft, I was Mr. You don't take you don't draft a tight end in round one of your rookie drafts. It's just a waste of pick. You should be hitting at, like, 40%. Uh, you know, near the end of round one, and if you're taking a ten or twelve percent bet, that's just a bad bet. But like Mike said, after your the one hundred eight, the one hundred eight to the two hundred eight is like I don't know. They're all twelve percent bets. Yeah, it's um, it's gonna be wild. Let's get into some news. News and notes from around the league. Well, before this first story, I just need to check in with Brooksy. Do you know how many days until the ultimate draft kit yet? <laughs> 23. 23. All right. Days. Yeah. 23 days. I, I kind of thought it was a soft buy through earlier because in our Slack channel yesterday, you had posted 24 days Yeah, just until with, the UDK. And so then today, I was like, he can do. Don't make Brooks do that, He can math. do the math. I should have been able to just with the weird recording time and everything. Okay. Just, didn't want to. You weren't sure where we are. Didn't want to miss. Yeah, you know. exactly. Didn't. Yeah. Um, what's the latest on Isaiah Pacheco? Because we got some Matthew Betts injury notes. He, uh, he had a couple of offseason surgeries. Yeah, it seems that he did. He broke a bone in his thumb in the AFC title game. He played through that. He's already had surgery for that. He also played through a torn labrum in the shoulder for a lot of the season. Uh, he had that surgery two weeks after the Super Bowl. So, I mean, he should, he should be good to go. But this is something that you need to to at least track through the off season. It's pretty important to me that my 
is somewhat into Clyde at some point in this offseason. Oh, that's impossible. With that, the the pain the the pain that Clyde Edwards Alaire brings me every time I he's still on my roster. Every time guys. you look at your dynasty he's still roster, still on my roster. I log in and I go, oh, that's not Jonathan Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> There's mold in like, the walls of my dynasty team. Like I'm 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 still over. My roster is still uh, two players over, so I can't do anything. I'm locked on sleeper. I can't make waiver Are ads. You considering, I and I'm like, who should I drop? Hmm. Well, there's Clyde. <laughs> oh man, it's like, <laughs> would he, it feel good? Oh, it would feel great until <laughs> until, until everyone he gets picked up. Bids on him. <laughs> I feel like can, that's a funny viral video. Is that like, if you have a guy that you really want to rage drop, you put your, you like go get in the bubble bath, <laughs> get the glass of wine. <laughs> And get real comfortable. Put, you know, have some a good adult contemporary on the some, radio. Yeah, and then you hit that button. Feels pretty good. Look, it's going to happen at some point. <laughs> <laughs> You're just, you know that day's it, coming. It is inevitable. Very much like Thanos. But I can't do it yet. No. He's going to sign as a backup somewhere next year. Where it's like, oh, he's, he's just... Gonna, he's going to turn it around. No just, way. Gonna no turn way. It around. But, uh, enough to where you can't drop him ever. Pacheco, uh, f for what it's worth, the team kind of said, with their actions, I think, their expectation for Pacheco is to be heavily involved and that yes. they're not concerned about it because they didn't really add anybody. They re-signed McKinnon, but that was expected. Um, all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, give it to me. ESPN's John Kime reports that second-year quarterback Sam Howell, Howell! Uh, has shown enough to convince the commanders yeah. he's their starter. Showed him some fur. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> so dumb. Let, uh, consider me uh, uh, suspicious of the commanders knowing what a starting quarterback is. Because there's, no there's been no team more unsure of their starting quarterback in the last five, six years than, than the commanders. And so... I can tell – I told these guys when I was going through my commander's statistics, I split Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett. Um, so, could, could he emerge? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like it's – you might as well just uh, say, chat GPT, write me up the uh, optimistic case for, for Taylor Heineke, but substitute Sam Howell's name into it for this upcoming season. And it would read the same. So I'm not saying Sam Howe can't do it. I'm saying that they've had 12 quarterbacks in five years or whatever it is. So it, I, I'm playing the bet that you're playing against the Eagles and the Cowboys and a good Giants team in your division. So you're probably not going to win all of your football games. And, and it seems like when the going gets tough in Washington, one of the first things they do is change quarterbacks. So that's all I'm saying. Yeah, you're right. I, I really like Sam Howell as a prospect, but the – correct bet to make is certainly against him uh m very few middling uh young quarterbacks turn into something good but for fantasy purposes I I, I agree with you I split with Jacoby Brissett um I only gave Sam Howe 14 games that being said he'll be the starter you know week one that's that's what it seems like coming yeah, that's out this from Washington and that's what same. matters for drafting in fantasy and if you're in a uh, super flex league two quarterback I think grabbing Sam Howell as your quarterback three is a great decision because he is a mobile quarterback he's not athletically gifted you know t to the degree of these great m dual threats we have now in the NFL but he ran for over like 850 yards his final year what? in uh college and yeah, so, with the pack. So he, oh, I like it. Right? <laughs> this is brutal. <laughs> yes. So he <laughs> will add enough on the ground to, I think, have fantasy relevance. In fact, at his one single start, the end of last year, I think he was a top ten quarterback, and he was he didn't have great passing numbers. I but think he, had, he ran for a touchdown. Yeah, he had a rushing touchdown, yeah. five rushing attempts. If you get five rushing attempts a game, you're going to be okay in fantasy. What is what is the like if you were to adjust your howling? For kind of like the season long picture of Sam Howell, what would that potentially sound like? For a full season? Full season. He, so he plays all 17? Uh, no, I just mean you said super flex. That means you're not thinking about him in redraft. So what's, no. the, what's the proper Howell? I'm just saying. It's uh, quarterback 22. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All I right. accept. It's probably about right. Um, Mike, you got any other zingers in the wolf uh, realm? Uh, the, I'm going to hit the shop. I'll have a few okay. for you in a, okay. in a couple moments. 
Uh, anything to add there, Mike, or do you want to talk about Corey Davis I, being on the New York football no, the, Jets? The, the Sam Howell big question for me is more Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson. And <sighs> what I make, I love <sighs> Dotson this year. I, Andy's breathing heavy. I think he's also feeling the Dotson this year. And it's, I love the Dotson what, last year. We just didn't get enough Dotson. Right. But that's what do you do? We didn't get Dotson. enough Dotson. <laughs> Dotson, we've yeah. got Dotson We didn't here. get enough of him last year, and now he has Sam Howell slash Jacoby Brissett. Well, I mean, I guess Jacoby got it done for Amari Cooper last year. Let's get Jacoby in there. Corey Davis will be on the team, which he, is one of the highest endorsements you can receive as a player. Uh, he will should be on be. the team. Corey Davis has played very well for the Jets. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, and they don't have um, a big wide receiver. You know, they don't grow on trees, so having one – a depth piece with injuries, with underperforming, you know, four wide receivers. Um, Corey Davis is a role to play. Yeah, he's actually a really he helps Aaron Rodgers. I mean, uh, I think Corey Davis is a very good wide receiver. He's just considered a bust because he was a top ten pick, right, in the NFL draft. That's yeah. a funny top thing. Five? If he was a third round pick, yeah, if he was a third round pick, you'd go, man, this guy's really good. But he's he, done a lot in his years. Yeah, yeah, he he's a he's a good wide receiver. I'll be interested to see the split between him and Lazard. Because they are both the bigger wide receiver types, and you know Aaron Rodgers usually gets his guy that he likes, and so I wonder if that will come at the expense of Corey Davis or not. But this is a pretty good wide receiver room that the Jets have assembled. Yeah, that, that they were a very interesting team to break down target wise and and kind of philosophy wise in terms of the running game. Uh, Dan Arnold agreed to a one year deal with the Eagles. <laughs> what the Postman is what? back. Yeah. I, I can see Al over there searching for the. Uh, That's what you get when you mess with the postman. Was there dust on that drop? <laughs> yeah, there was. I there cleaned was. it off. You cleaned it off. Yeah, there, I mean, okay. The Eagles have a different backup, so if Dallas Goddard goes down again, Dan Arnold could become Jack Stoll plus. And then uh, I think that's it. I think that's all we're gonna do here. Let's take a quick break and come back with old, bland, and undervalued. All right, one of the things that I, I found very informative going through all these teams this past weekend was the amount of players that I think fit into a category of of, of fatigued for the fantasy world. You know, they're, they've been around the block. Maybe their ceiling isn't what it once was. And so players, I think, are going to be ignored in that category that are going to have valuable roles. So I want to talk about some of those guys right now. Old, bland, and undervalued. When did when did that drop? <laughs> when did you do that one? I don't know. It caught me off guard All too. All around the mulberry bush. <laughs> um. All right, players that are not old, busted for fantasy football, but probably are in people's minds. Give me a name. Somebody that you think will be ignored or undervalued. I'm interested to hear your case here on on yours, Mike, because. This is a really good name because I am fatigued. I am worried. So tell me why maybe we shouldn't be. So it is Mike Evans. I've of, heard of him. Of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, wide receiver who has never had fewer than 1,000 yards every single year of his career. Fun stat. When I did the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, okay. I, I broke down the target market share, the, the percent I thought that he would receive of the team and the targets, his yards per reception, all that stuff. When I hit enter on my final thing on the yardage, I was not trying to do this. He ended with 1,001 receiving yards to keep the streak alive. So last year it was 1,100 yards in 15 games. That was... Uh, no, that was one game. 1,100 was, yards in one game. Oh, it, yeah. It was a little bit juiced by a 200-yard performance of the final year or the, the final game of the season for him. But even before that happened, he was still on a 17-game pace of 1,100 yards. Which, when you said when you throw that out, you say, "Hey, you know, we finished 1,100." That sounds fantastic. Like that sounds like a really strong season. And then you realize that's that's 65 yards a game, <laughs> and the, which is that's what Mike Evans was doing. He was putting up five for 65. He was not scoring touchdowns, so that is a little bit of a concern. But the the, the fact is he was still pacing for 1,100 yards. The quarterback situation, the offensive situation is completely changing around him. That is 
true, and it is a little bit scary, but Mike Evans is still a good player. For someone to go out, and he's almost 30 years old, and have a 200-yard, three-touchdown game, there aren't there are very few wide receivers in the NFL that can actually do that for one game. Mike Evans is not what he was, you know, five years ago. He will not be what he was for your fantasy team this year with that. But he's going to be just, I, I think, left for dust. Of People are not going to be interested in Mike Evans. And he's someone, someone who can still give you some burst games and give you some consistent production along the way. And he's going to be go. You, he will not be regular Mike Evans draft price this year. You know, he certainly won't. I mean, I, I, I worry because he's he'll play at 30 years old this year, which I don't think is too old for him. He, uh, you know, like you said, that final game, you, you saw that he's still got juice. But the situation around him at age 30 with Kyle Trask slash Baker Mayfield, final year of the contract, let's say he has a real dud season. Does he have at age 31 teams clamoring to give him a heavy role in their offense? I'm sure he'll get another contract, but a lot of times we see those plus 30-year-old uh, once great wide receivers switch teams a la you know, A.J. Green and just pretty much be irrelevant. So I, like, I, I am a little worried that how much I would pay to acquire Mike Evans. I do think that the situation could have been worse at quarterback because I think Baker's the guy. If you listen to the comments from Bruce Arians, I don't know if you saw them recently, but, I mean, he says he has ba he had Baker Mayfield ahead of Stroud, Bryce Young, Anthony Richardson, Will Levis in this draft. Well, Bruce Arians also hates rookies. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that he said out of those four, he has Baker ranked higher. He said that was his honest opinion. Um, what did he say about uh, Mr. Trask? Uh, I didn't see any comments on Trask. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> but like a lot, I know some people are projecting those guys to split this year because they're kind of hedging. I think it'll be Baker, and I think Baker is more in the realm of what you, what you got from, you know, look, Jameis wasn't a good quarterback, but Jameis provided value. And I don't think that Baker is Jameis, but Baker is also not – only a dink and dunk quarterback that's not going to challenge down the field. And look, if you throw the ball up to a guy that big, you're going to have an opportunity for touchdowns, which that variability for Mike Evans has always been there. If it's a, if it's a seven, eight, nine touchdown year, you're going to be really happy with the draft pick. You're probably getting 70 receptions and you're probably getting a thousand yards. Um, so it's an interesting name because I do think, you know, we've been here before with Mike Evans where he's just kind of, everyone's used to Mike Evans. There's lots of reasons to not take him this year, which maybe people are looking for. So I, I get it. And so in your dynasty leagues, what are you? How are you pricing Mike Evans as either I'm going to trade him away, or I'm going to trade for Mike Evans? I don't know that I can receive enough back for Mike. Like I don't know that I'm going to get a first round I'm in pick this boat. for someone great. You, you have you have Mike now, okay. Yeah, I have Mike Evans. Yeah, so I, I feel like the right approach, unless you can get you know what projects to be a high end first round pick, which I would take for Mike Evans. Um, oh yeah, that, I, I think anybody would. Yeah, I I and I don't think you're going to get that. In which case, your best bet is to just ride him into the sunset. You know, th sometimes that is the best thing with these really good aged veterans. You know, it's like for years and years and years, it was like, oh, do I trade Larry Fitzgerald? Do I? You know, he's he's thirty, he's thirty one. No, just just keep getting fantasy points every year from him. Eventually, he will retire, or has he even retired? He, he will I, stop playing yeah. football. Um, and I think that's my approach with Mike Evans. Yeah. You will look in your hands. One day, the bag will be there, and you'll say, "Well, <laughs> that's all right." And then you'll just have a have a ceremony where right. where mean, you go in the backyard and you're like, "Thank you, thank you." I've definitely tested the market, and I haven't received responses proportional. To what I, the Mike Evans name has meant yeah. in the past. Oh, I know, because I tried tried to trade him last year. I mean, eventually I successfully did, but people were not respecting the Mike Evans, and they would have won a championship if they had. Just... Nope, no, I respected <laughs> oh. it. Yeah, uh, I had oh, him yeah. on my team. Oh yeah, well. Yeah, I lost I mean, in the semis, Mike. We did champ, champ, champ over champ, here. Champ, champ, Mike Evans. <laughs> um, I've got another thirty year old. If people trusted <laughs> me, they would have won a championship. Hey. I trusted you. 203. I didn't say it was going to be great before then. I just said 
championship game. You yeah. said, do I get a championship out of Mike's statement? No, no, you do not. Um, so m- m- my pick for old, bland, and undervalued, not really bland uh, by any means. Not this really is an exciting, old. Well, he's t- 29. And not really undervalued. <laughs> he's 29. He's, he's known as two years <laughs> older than your old pick. He's still a first-round pick in startup drafts. But well, my pick is not selected for old. It's selected for bland. Oh, okay. I didn't know we were... Uh, I selected mine for old. 29-year-old Tyreek Hill, to me, the reason that I'm bringing him up is because when you hit this age, sometimes people get scared. When you see the reports, and I know this in our league, when the reports came out about him wanting to retire after this contract, I got a I got an offer. And um, so it's like, I, I would go out and trade for Tyreek Hill if I can acquire him because... My belief of Tyreek Hill is that you're going to get three more full seasons. That's what he basically what his contract actually is. And all three of those, I believe, are going to be elite, going to be absolutely phenomenal. And sometimes you, you know, these crazy speed guys in the NFL, the ones that are just like wildly different than others. We've seen it with some, you know, uh, Hall of Fame cornerbacks. They just don't lose their speed. You know, uh, Deshaun Jackson, like, you just stay fast. And if that's your weapon, I don't think he's going to – I think he's going to play phenomenally for three years, be great for fantasy for three years, and then move on. And that's kind of the window that I look at my dynasty rosters with. If you're if you're trying to be like, oh, I care so much about six, seven, eight years from now, the, I mean, situations change too much. So for me, I'm still willing to pay – premium like pretty much top dollar for uh for Tyree Kill because I believe that he will dominate for several more years so would you trade the 103 oh that's a great question so or, would I trade one, Jackson the, Smith and, yes and Jigba for Tyree Kill I, I I would I would trade every pick except for the 101 I I tried really hard to get Tyree Kill this offseason in You're, dynasty and uh, he's number three for me in redraft this year. Uh, I agree with everything Jason said. If there's any doubt going through anybody's mind, it's it is a little funny because of our mental perception of like Mike Evans feels like he is maybe entering a nursing home at twenty nine point seven. Tyree Kill is twenty nine point one, and I agree that he's got everything left in the tank. I think he's going to be dominant, but they're not that far apart age wise. <laughs> no, they're not. And so Mike that, Evans- that might speak to Mike Evans having more value for a couple of years where. Mike Evans was still 14.6 yards per catch. If I could get Mike Evans receptions. to go be a flex or a, a wide receiver two on a dynasty team on the cheap because people want to cash in on the, you know, the the age and go get younger. I mean, would you rather have Brandon Ayuk or Mike Evans if on a contending team? Ooh, Ayuk. Yeah, I think they're going to be near enough to each other this year where I'll I'll still take the age. Okay. Uh, the player I'm going to bring up is – is it's very intentional. It's Terry McLaurin. Oh, I traded him too. Uh, <laughs> because fundamentally, Terry McLaurin is a very good player. He's great. And he's under contract for three more years. Um, he, was, he had the ninth most receiving yards last year, the fourth most deep targets – and I know we're going to spend a lot of this offseason talking about Jahan Dotson because I think he's a, a very good player that's going to get a lot of attention. I think he's a breakout candidate. And here's Terry McLaurin, who has gone on the roller coaster ride of quarterbacks that I talked about earlier. Here comes Sam Howell and Jacoby Brissett. Last year is Taylor Heineke and, and what, Carson Wentz? Um, you know, we, we've been through the game with Terry McLaurin. And it's not a very fun one because you just, it's unpredictable. But every year we have these weeks where you come on and reflect on the week. I'm like, oh, yeah, Terry McLaurin was doing Terry McLaurin stuff this week. He's a really, really good wide receiver. And I don't think he's probably valued the way that he should be because the situation is not very fun. McLaurin has not, he's not broken out into being a, a, a kind of like a foundational roster piece. Yeah, he's, he feels which people like people thought he would. Yeah, and it's. I think that's the quarterback problem. He's just kind of been stuck at, and by stuck, I mean he's still you know the last three years over a thousand, uh, over eleven hundred two of those three years. But for Terry McLaurin, it is it's touchdowns. I mean five this past year, five before that, four. His rookie year, he had seven. That was the uh, and he had you know Alex Smith, I believe. For wait, 
Who did he have? Was it Alex Smith? Kyle, I remember that right? Yeah. So we had Alex Smith for for some of that at least. Uh, so he's a he's a fantastic player, but he will continue to be limited uh, by his quarterbacks. Yeah. So I mean, you're going to have probably a lot of I think a lot of Jahan Dotson excitement and not a lot of Terry McLaurin excitement. So, so what would you trade for Terry? Would you go late first round pick? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If I could if I could take would you <laughs> like go... a one oh eight, we we were just talking about how to me that is I mean, if if anyone would fall hook, line, and sinker for that, I would do it in without thinking. Would you do it for a first and a second this year? Yeah, this year I would. I I, I you know, if it's a late first. Right. Um, if it's a late first and add a second to get a known commodity that look, the quarterback situation isn't better. It's going to be the same that he's experienced, but like you said, 1,100 yards, two of the last three years, over 1,000 all three years, very consistent. He was the wide receiver 14 this past year, and when I finished some of my stats with, you know, obviously this is some on, on the, the commanders and, and some on the, the Cowboys, but I was kind of shocked to see that uh, he was ahead of CeeDee Lamb in my Terry? rankings for this season, yes. Uh, the way that I've got the what I know that's what? look that's one of the it surprised me the reason I'm bringing this up is I wasn't trying to have that happen wow. but I think that the the market share for this commanders team is going to be uh when I, when I went back and I looked at the games that that Dotson played in healthy and looked at um the tendencies of Sam a, Howell that would be a top three steamiest take in the history yeah. of the show if that's where they end up. Uh, that may they may be number one. There you go. The, you, you, I'm not saying it's um gonna I, be Mike, beloved Mike, by everyone. Are your pants? Did they fly off when I you said that? If that was if if uh if I ranked that way, and my statistics came out and look, these things happen. But I would take my computer, I would smash it to pieces. I would never tell anyone <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> And I would start over. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I get it, but, but I, I I do think that the I've commanders got McLaurin at twenty two right now. With uh, with the way that the target market share is going to break down for certain players, JD McKissick being gone, I don't think Curtis Samuel is going to be as involved as he was last year. If you look at the games where Dotson was healthy, and you look at wh how the target market share broke down, I think it's going to be really heavy on McLaurin and Dotson. Those two guys sure. are going to get probably, I think, 50% of the targets. And it's, there's a Mike McCarthy problem in Dallas. Well, I, I, I was going to add, Jason actually projected Dak Prescott for eight pass attempts this year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> which is what hurt the C.D. Lamb, because he had seven of when them. I, when I said he was ahead of C.D. Lamb, I have Terry McLaurin as my wide receiver, 82. <laughs> and C.D. Lamb is going to catch half of those passes. Yeah, four, half of the eight attempts. Four passes. Um, I no, didn't know we were going to wow. get like I some didn't... magma on the show today. I was not ready. Wow. I'm I, I, glad I, it was I, you, look, not I, me. I apologize for the insanity of that. You should apologize I, to everyone who's in a ravine right now. <laughs> because, because they, they careened their cars I'm off just of having that. a nice commute to work. Jason, what? <laughs> and now they're on the side of the road. Sorry, everyone. There's a lot of people on the side of the road right now. I hope you have good insurance. Yeah, AAA getting some calls. Um, let's talk some mailbag. Let's do it. Sure. Mailbag. Mailbag Dynasty. Thank you. Uh, if you have a question for the show, go to the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. Click the submit a question button or dial the voicemail hotline 302-464-TFFB. We got a voicemail question, Brooksy? I have a question. Uh-oh. Uh, I've, I've, I was looking at Jason's rankings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, I feel like we could spend the entire... Great Scott! Spend the rest of the show there. Wow. All right. Uh, here's Here. a voicemail question. Hey, ballers. This is Amp from L.A. I have a dynasty question here, and I just wanted to know when you take over a bad team, and you totally didn't make it that way, uh, what do you do? How do you improve it? Well, right. uh, you certainly blame the previous manager publicly. Yes. No, number one, you say, I didn't do this. This is not my fault. Uh, so the, but the question is, if you're taking over an orphaned dynasty roster and it's a bad roster, what do you do? Uh, I mean, the, the first thing I would say is mentally accept what this team is and what you are going to have to do uh, like as in time wise, the, the amount of time you're going to have to invest 
of losing seasons to get this thing back into shape. And the the quickest way really is you're going to have to look at your blue chip players and you're going to have to go and like search inside cuz trading trading blue chip players is very 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 difficult. But it can be done. There's going to be a team out there that has a bunch of picks or maybe some young players uh that you can trade your superstar for and just you got to start accumulating picks and accumu- accumulating youth because for you these th- these old bland undervalued players that we just talked about their value to you is trading. You they're not going to help you right now because if you're years away, Mike Evans who is going to be 30, he's not going to help you when he's 33. You need to be looking towards the future and you got to be uh, you got to be throwing some haymakers too. Yeah, and you want a shotgun approach rookie draft. So what you're saying is right. You trade a bunch whatever veterans you have, you get picks for them. Get as many firsts as humanly possible. Tear your team down to the nubs because honestly, you want to make sure that you get that one hundred and one or one hundred and two. You you want your team to be bad because the difference between whether you get that one hundred and one or whether you're mediocre and you're picking at the five spot, you need one of those foundational players to build a new lineup on. And if you've got six, seven, eight picks, then you can shotgun approach and and maybe you hit on three of them and now you've got three great young players to build on going forward. So that's that's usually my approach is tear it down to the nubs. Uh, it's 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 like baseball rebuilding. If you're an MLB franchise, I mean you 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 need to stock the farm system and give yourself the highest percentage chance of having some young players come up and emerge like you said. And honestly, the nicest thing about taking over the orphan team is that you get at least 5 seasons of at the end of the year, when someone looks at the result, you get to go with the line. These were the cards I were I was dealt. Yeah, we should let's check. Owl, you've been rebuilding your team for about twelve, four, four to oh. eight years or so. What? Uh, what? How have how have you managed to stay rebuilding? <laughs> <laughs> that is not entirely true. I have, I have been very <laughs> mediocre for four to, How have four you to eight years. managed to stay rebuilt? <laughs> the, the actual rebuild just started last year. Oh, oh okay. And okay. the previous few years were more. It was well, pre, middle, middle pre of the rebuild. pack every year. Actually, <laughs> genuinely, I think. Pre building. First of all, two things. One, Mike, excellent. Excellent <laughs> oh, work man. there. I mean, man. that was a great line, and he deserved everything you gave him. Um, but also, I, th- I think Owl's team is a great example he was middle of the pack he he never did the tear it down to the nubs approach and he just was you know outside of the playoffs but never getting a good enough pick to where he could rebuild and so last year you actually did you had the fire sale and you got rid of players and you, do you looked still have for DeAndre the- Swift we do that's his that- one <laughs> no that, I mean that was um I remember being pretty jealous of DeAndre Swift the last few years on your roster and trying to come after him and feeling like he was kind of the linchpin of your future. I bet you can get him now. <laughs> well, I, I'm just thinking back as I was like, man, that that outlook changed for somebody like DeAndre Swift that seemed like he could be foundational, and that's just uh, – does that say anything about the rebuilding process? Because you, you can – It's Yeah, it's not a perfect science at all, but it, that's why Jason was saying shotgun approach of, of there will be hits in the first round of the rookie draft. There will be some big hits, but it's th- when you just have like one or two, your your chance of hit of getting the guy who really breaks out it's it's not high. And be excited for for twenty twenty four because you have like this year we were pumped for Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, to come into the draft and be the number one wide receiver, but you knew that this wasn't a Jamar Chase level of excitement. You're pumped for him, but you know that the NFL isn't going to take him in the top ten next year. We have Marvin Harrison Jr. Oh baby, is go he, Cardinals. He will be a Jamar Chase level of wide receiver. He should, he should end up getting drafted top ten minimum. He, um, I think he could. Yeah, I think he could end up That's, being I'm a just, I'm, two, three pick. Um, but is there? I guess the reason I brought up Swift wasn't just. I mean, punching Al, always willing. It's a good time, but not really the point. The point was like. There was opportunities on a rebuilding team to trade DeAndre Swift for a couple of years, so it's like you could have accumulated assets when that other younger asset's big. How do you make those calls? Uh, You just try to make the best decision you can at the time, and you'll get some right and you'll get some wrong. It it, it really does go back to the 
um, when, when we say the shotgun approach, it just means you need more ammunition so yeah. that some bullets hit. That's 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 all it is. You you want you you really really need um, multiple just see the scratchers. Future. Just see the future. Yeah, that or would help. or yeah, yeah one of those uh, books from the future. Uh, Instagram question from uh, Spin John Twenty Four Single Quarterback League Traylon Burks or the One Hundred Seven Rookie Pick. Oh man. I would I'll take, take Traylon Burks. I, I believe that when he was on the field, which was not enough his rookie year, he was actually pretty good. His targets per route run were pretty good. Um, I liked a lot of what I saw, enough to where I didn't – you know, we we talk a lot about when a rookie wide receiver comes out and fails their rookie year. They usually don't just turn it around. That Failing doesn't mean bad stats just necessarily. That's not the end of it. Like, Traylon didn't have a great uh, statistical season – but when he was out there, he he passed the eyeball test. He looked good. His numbers were think, good behind the scene. And the depth chart right I now is... I think Tennessee has the worst wide receiver depth chart I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, it's... Legitimately, I think it's the worst. It's Because, like you said, Traylon did not prove to a high degree that he, he could even remotely hold up this entire offense. And then you go Nick Westbrook, Akine, and Kyle Phillips... I mean, the options they have there are devoid of of real confidence. So it's just for the context that we have, our – Racy McMath. <laughs> oh, what a name. <laughs> so good. Uh, our Dynasty League, I got Zay Flowers at the 107. Now, I, I don't know if Zay Flowers will always be there uh, f for people out there, but Zay Flowers or Traylon Burks is – Yeah, I'll take a Zay Flowers and is that, a, if, is if a very, that's on the table. So yeah. I guess it's really close. Whew. That's tough. Um, Instagram question from Philip Favia. Who is your dynasty RB1? It's Bijan. Hasn't played a snap of NFL football yet, but his draft capital talent situation says we know he's going to have a great rookie year. He's younger than everyone that we know is going to be a relevant back. He's going in the first round of redraft leagues right now. He's usually the third running back taken um, that I've seen in, in best ball drafts. So if you're talking about that happening for a, a this season now for a 21-year-old running back, there's what is, nobody better. Mike, what is the list of players that are acceptable one overall picks? Uh, I think that Jonathan Taylor is still, for running back, is, yes. is still worth being the number one. Brees Hall is in that conversation. And then the, the hardest one – there is Christian McCaffrey because if you're looking at a three-year window <clears throat> with the situation and the contract that Christian McCaffrey has in San Francisco he for three years he he could be the running back one or or I won't get super hot takey but he could be a top five easily a top five running back each of the next three years and be the most valuable guy but he is I mean his his time is running out. Do like, you think he's worthy of being a one oh one, Jason? The one oh one, no. I would never take him ahead of Bijan, but he is worthy of being in the conversation of how high are you drafting a pretty much twenty seven year old running back? Usually it's never. But to Mike's point, if you took the twenty six year old slightly older, slightly smaller Austin Eckler three years ago, right, and just had domination for the last three years you'd be pretty happy and it was a good move and I believe that and if you is, had taken Derrick Henry three years ago yeah I mean you you've it's rough you know that everything we talk a lot about making uh bets on the odds of probability and but we've got to have context to it Christian McCaffrey is an outlier prospect outlier player one of the best what he does with his training and his body is there's a it's not like He's just he was born a really good running back. This guy is a nut job in the best <laughs> way possible. And you see it on the field. It's similar to Austin Eckler. You will look at his workout videos and um you know what he does for his body. I I think you you're darn right Christian McCaffrey's going to have three good years and I will bet on the rare 27-year-old running back in dynasty to be a good pick let, right now. Let, let me put it uh one one interesting take would be like Kenneth Walker was probably a lock ahead of Christian McCaffrey in dynasty drafts, and then he wasn't. 
Yeah, back. Uh, Jonathan very, very Taylor close. was probably a lock to be the one hundred and one in everyone's mind for a handful of years, and now he isn't. And so it's kind of it's tough when you say, like, I I have him one too. I have Bijan one too, or, or as number one as well. So I don't. I, I'm not objecting to the upside there because you get such longevity. But man, things change really quickly. Saquon was in that boat. Mm-hmm. I mean, Saquon is not super old yet, but he's not close to number one in dynasty leagues like he was at one point in time. So um, I think maybe opening up that window and not locking it in is such a guarantee, like it has to be this guy and leaving a little subjectivity there is wise. I mean, if you are strongly convicted that it should be, you know, Brees Hall, because you've seen it on the NFL field, go with that gut, do it. Jonathan Taylor, if you think he's going to be himself, he's fine to, to be that pick. And then obviously Terry McLaurin's in contention as right, well. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, do you go Bijan or Terry McLaurin at 101? Uh, that is it for today's show. FootClanGiveaway.com, a signed Justin Jefferson jersey. Oh, man. I can't wait for Twitter. All right. FootClanGiveaway.com. Go get that jersey. We'll talk to you on Thursday. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.